we've rolled out some definitions and we have come up with a scheme of classification. Now in order to actually apply this, we'll have to perform some experiments and collect some data. And the way that we jot down data in a specific objective manner is that we have to perform measurements. That's any process which determines a property. Now, we could be trying to determine a mathematical property, something that's quantitative, measuring a number. For example, that a car is moving 50 kilometers an hour, we could measure if our radar gun. Or we might have a metal detector and just be determining, is this car made out of metal or isn't it? That's a qualitative property where we just want to know if it has a characteristic or if it doesn't have a characteristic. In order to communicate the results of our experiments with other scientists, we're going to need to establish a vocabulary of measurement. Now, this is something that's lacking during the early development of science. In the 19th century, France is the hub of scientific development. If you publish a scientific paper, it's going to be published in French probably. Well, within just the nation of France, there's over 250,000 types of units. So let's say that you are a barrel maker in France during this time. You're going to want to have some standardization for your barrels. You don't want them to be all different sizes because you want to be able to you know, have set prices, five francs per barrel or something of that nature, which isn't going to work if your barrels vary. Sometimes your customers are going to be cheated and sometimes you're going to cheat yourself. So the way that you resolve this is in the town center set up some iron spikes a fixed distance apart. Now everyone in town can lay the planks for their barrels in between these spikes. And that's going to standardize the size of the barrels. Now the issue, we've solved this problem for a particular town. But what about the next town over? They're going to have a different widths between their spikes, and so they're going to have different size barrels. Well, easy enough to solve. You just have to choose one of these sizes. Well, unfortunately, we're human beings. So what happens when town one says, hey, use my uh, metric? Town two says, no, why don't we use our metric? And so for all these different towns, you have all these different standardized links and no way to come to a consensus on what unit should actually be used universally. This is a problem for scientists. The reason it's a problem for scientists is because if you're a scientist in town one, you might measure the speed of light as being 3.5 barrel lengths per second, while a scientist in town two measures the speed of light as being 4 billion billion barrel lengths per second. Well, is that because the speed of light varies between these two towns? Is it because one of these scientists made an error in their measurements? How are you going to compare them unless you both agree on what the standard way of measuring is. The answer is that you can't, so you have to come up with a universal standard in order to do it. Because it's so essential to the progress of science at this point that some standardized units of measure are established for common use among scientists, in 1792, the French Royal Society sends out two astronomers. Send out Jean-Baptiste de Lambert, and he heads up north to Denmark, and Pierre-Francois-André Michet head south to Barcelona. Why are these guys headed different directions? Well, what they're doing is they're taking some surveying measurements. They're trying to measure the longitudinal circumference of the Earth. And this is going to resolve that difficulty with no one being able to agree on using someone's units versus someone else's units because of a nationalistic sentiment. We're all based on planet Earth, so no one's going to object to using that as a standard. So their mission is that they're going to define the meter as one ten millionth of the distance between the North Pole and the equator. Why one ten millionth? Because that's roughly the size of units which are in use. And so it seems like it'll be a useful unit of measure. And they're doing this during a time of political upheaval in France. So you present the wrong paper somewhere, you might get in serious trouble. But it's such an important issue that they're willing to go on this adventure in order to come to the final conclusion. 1799, Michel and Lambert return, and the Royal Society throws a big party, and they establish the meter and the kilogram as standard units of measurement. The meter is 
represented by a fixed length platinum rod equal to the size that Machine and Delambre have calculated based on their measurements is one ten millionth the distance between the North Pole and the equator. And copies of this rod are made and distributed to other nations, and so scientists in those nations can compare and everyone can agree on the size of the meter. A kilogram is based on the meter. If you were to take a cubic meter of water and divide it into a thousand equal pieces, the volume of one of those pieces is called a liter, and the mass of that would be equal to one kilogram. And you do this at four degrees Celsius because that's when water is most dense. Now later on, additional units are added to the SI system. There is second to measure time. There's the ampere to measure current. There's kelvins to measure temperature, candela to measure luminosity, and moles to measure quantity. And these provide these seven fundamental units of the SI system. All other units are based off of these seven units. What if we want to work on different size scales? If we're trying to measure the diameter of a bacterium, or if we're trying to measure the distance between our solar system and Alpha Centauri, it might be inconvenient to those very small and those very large scales to be using a meter stick. Well, rather than invent entirely new units to handle those cases, what we can do is simply adjust the size of our standardized units. And the way we do that is with these multiplicative factors. So what we can do is say that we have a, a much larger scale than a standard meter. You might look over here and see that this K stands for kilo, which stands for multiply by a thousand times. So if we have a thousand meters, we can instead write that as one kilo meter or one kilometer. And now we have a much larger scale in which to operate. And you might notice something about these factors over here. The ones that we've defined, they tend to go by powers of three. So we go from the third power to the sixth power to the ninth power to the twelfth power, etc. Now for that reason, we usually tend to write our numbers so that they have a group of three digits at most on the left side of the decimal. So say you have the number 215,800 meters. The way you might instead write that is 215.8 kilometers. We could also go the other direction. So say that we have 0. 0.000 Zero four six grams. We have one, two, three, four, five, six places to the right of the decimal. We would like to shift this so that these numbers instead appear on the left side of the decimal. Well, if we look at our factors over here, this micro represented by the Greek mu stands for 10 to the minus six. And if we divide this by 10 to the minus 6, that will move these digits all the way over there. So this will become instead 46 micrograms, where micro stands for multiply by 10 to the minus 6. And if we do that, if we multiply 10 to the minus 6 times this number, we will get this number over here. So the numbers are equal, but it might be more convenient to write this 46 micrograms all the time, rather than writing all these zeros and then 46 grams. There's another type of notation we can use to represent different scales of number, and this is called scientific notation. The way you use scientific notation is that you write down the first digit of your number, you put the decimal point and the other numbers, and then you put whatever multiplier you need in order to shift your number to look like the previous number. So for example, our 215,800 meters, we would write that two to the left of the decimal, then we write the decimal point, then we write all the rest of those numbers on the right of the decimal point, 
And then we have a multiplicative factor here, always represented as 10 to the power of something. So if we took 10 to the power of five and multiplied it by this number here, we would get back our original number. This is very convenient because this will work for any number and it doesn't require remembering those prefixes. So of course also works going the other direction. So if we have our 0 0.000046 grams, we are now dealing with some division by powers of 10. So that's where this minus sign comes in. So if we were to divide 4.6 by 10 five times, we would move the decimal over one, two, three, four, five times and get back our original number. 